Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Ashley Stoneholm. I'm with the Prince William Conservation Alliance. Uh, it's great to have you here with us to explore designing cities for nature. I think it's a, a great topic uh, to start us out on 2021 and um, it might help us reimagine what our urban and suburban spaces might look like. Um, as, al as always, this presentation will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, which I wanted to share just a, a brief moment with you all. So this is where all of our previous um, events have been recorded. And then you can also um, go to our our website and find all of our upcoming events. I wanted to highlight that next, in two weeks, we have the story of the forest that disappeared, but then was found in uh, the Bristow Station Battlefield Heritage Park with Julie Flanagan. And so we hope that uh, you will join us with join us for that upcoming event as well. And so you can find that on our website and then also on our um, Facebook page if that's, um, if you are a Facebook user. But um, tonight though, we are in for a treat. We have a very special guest speaker with us. Professor Timothy Geatley, who is a Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning at the School of Architecture and the University of Virginia, where he has taught for the last 30 years. And in fact, we have um, at least one of his previous students here with us, so that's fantastic. Um, Beatley is the author or co-author of more than 15 books, including Green Urbanism, Learning from European Cities, Native to Nowhere, Sustaining Home and Community in a Global Age, and Biophilic Cities, Integrating Nature into Urban Design and Planning, which um, I think we'll get into in, in depth in this discussion. Uh, Beatley directs the Biophilic Cities Project at UVA, and I would encourage you to check out their website at biophiliccities.org. It's, um, it's, it's really interesting to see the projects that are occurring globally through this network. And is also co-founder with Ruben Rainey of UVA Center for Design and Health with the School of Architecture. So Tim, thank you so much for being here with us tonight, and I will pass it on to you. Um, great. Well, thanks. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and find some slides, hopefully, and uh, see if I can get to them. Uh, anyways, great to be with you. And of course, they're right under, no, let's see, they're not there. Where are they? Oh, here they are. <laughs> um, but great to be with you. And I, as Ashley says, I'm going to do a little bit of a quick um, half hour or so um, talking about the role of nature in cities. And so hopefully you are beginning to see some slides coming up. Um, they're kind of churning. And so hopefully they'll be here in just, just a second. But, um, but yeah, so we started this thing called the Biophilic Cities Project in 2010 or, um, okay, that's actually not the place to start. But, Sorry. Um, lately, it seems like uh, just about every presentation I do has some kind of a Zoom issue. And so we'll try that again. Um, so, but we did we started this thing, it's about 10 years. Can you see that now, everybody? No. No. Oh, no, your screen is no longer oh, shared oh. with us. You are also occasionally muffled. I'm not sure if there's a microphone um, where your microphone is placed, but occasionally you're muffled and it's hard to hear. I have a, because I did have some huge problems, actually my um, speaker went out and laptop and I've got a loner at the moment. So um, can you hear me okay now? 
Better than before. Better than before. Okay. Okay. Share again. But it's, yeah. but it's still okay. Maybe I'll just talk a little louder. I don't know. Um, hopefully you can see the screen now. Yes. Um, okay. And you can see that, hopefully, by Felix Cities. Yes. yes? Good. Yep. Okay. We got. We're good. Uh, great. So, um, so yeah. So we have been exploring this idea of biophilia and this innate connection with the natural world. Um, it started really from well, it, it everything that I've done, I guess, in my career in one way or another has to do with how we balance uh, nature and development and growth and. Um, from the position that that nature is something that is absolutely essential, uh, that it's not something um, optional at all, that to lead uh, truly happy and healthy and meaningful lives, we, we really have to have that nature uh, all around us. So um, here's an image of, of Singapore. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Singapore. Um, but I am an urban planner, and a lot of my career has been about trying to understand sustainable cities and sustainable urbanism and sustainable growth. And we are uh, arguing for you know, more compact, uh, dense cities. We have lots of uh, challenges that we're facing. It's pretty daunt a pretty daunting time. We think about climate change and the need to move pretty quickly um, in, in the direction of renewable energy, and profoundly reducing our carbon uh, emissions, adapting to, to climate change. Um, so compactness and density are things that we're uh, frequently um, arguing for that they are good things, but then the typical response is, well, what kinds of places are they going to be? And are they, is there going to be a sufficient connection to the natural world, to, to nature? So we strongly believe that you can have the density, the compactness of the, the urban qualities, um, and also that connection with, with nature, with the natural world. So here's cities and nature with a question mark. Um, take away that question mark. We, we very much uh, uh, believe those things can and must, in fact, be, be together. So we have to give a lot of uh, credit to E.O. Wilson. He uh, wasn't the first person to use the word uh, biophilia. He's a, a, a biologist and conservationist at, at Harvard, uh, but he's really the one who's coined the term in the way that we uh, use it today or think of it today, this idea of, a, of an innate connection with, with uh, nature. And here's one uh, definition or one quote from, from E.O. Wilson. So, so as I said, about 2010 or so, we started the Biophilic Cities Project at UVA. Um, we had some initial funding from the Summit Foundation in Washington, DC. And that helped us, in fact, uh, do a couple of years of research where we were trying to understand what cities could do and what were the sort of best cities around the US and around the world in terms of incorporating nature, putting nature at the center of their design and, and planning. <clears throat> and at the end of that uh, couple of years of research, we actually brought uh, all the cities, representatives from all the cities to Charlottesville for a four day conference. And at the end of that, um, we weren't expecting to do it, but we basically started a, a network of cities, a global network of cities that's been growing uh, um, quite a lot lately. I'll tell you more about that. But a lot of evidence, of course, about the power of nature and a lot of um, work coming out of uh, medicine and, and uh, public health and economics and environmental psychology. And it seems like almost every week there is a new study. Uh, for most of us, though, I think it's very intuitive when you think about the things that we are drawn to, the things in the world that affect us uh, deeply. And I, I know for myself, it is those things in nature. It's the things, it, it, birds and, and flowers and, and butterflies and the, the living things around us that make life so uh, special and important um, and things like water. Uh, and we have a lot of evidence that, uh, that we've co-evolved <clears throat> to, to need and want the connection with things like water, for example. And water is a cue, in fact, for uh, it helps us to survive, <clears throat> a cue to, to sort of landscapes that, that, are, um, that, that are going to be ab ab abundant and actually help us to, to, to uh, survive. So um, we could spend the whole time talking about 
the evidence. This is one study um, from bioscience showing the connection, the relationship between um, the presence of nature, the greenness of neighborhoods, birds, shrubs, and trees. Um, and the, when you have those things, the lower levels of depression, anxiety, and, uh, and stress, not, not a big uh, surprise. <clears throat> Many of you probably know about the the forest bathing work, um, longstanding research coming out of Japan that shows that at the end of a walk in a forest, our stress hormone levels go down, uh, that we get a, a boost to our immune system from that, that walk uh, in the forest. Um, so in many ways, uh, nature is helpful. There's a power to having that nature around us. And there is a science uh, to biophilia. We don't entirely understand why it is that we feel so much better when we have nature around us and why, why it is that um, our, our uh, presence of nature enhances our cognitive uh, abilities and, and lowers our stress. Um, the fractals that we see in the natural world are undoubtedly a big part of the answer. Um, these are self-repeating shapes and forms and nature and things like trees on the right, the fact that that leaf is a small version of the bow, which is a small version of the larger uh, tree. And as Richard Taylor says in this quote, um, we really have evolved a visual system that's intended to sort of easily process those fractals. That's what uh, Taylor calls fractal fluency. Taylor is a chair of the physics department actually at the University of Oregon has been doing a lot of research about, about biophilia and about fractals. Uh, the image on the left, just a, a reminder of the power of birdsong. And this is an image actually from a really, really interesting initiative in the UK where they're uh, playing birdsong um, as a way of detecting hearing loss. Um, really interesting uh, project. But they're also uh, playing in, in, in hospitals. Uh, they're they're playing, uh, they're recording and playing birdsong at especially stressful times uh, when children are going into surgery or are about to be inoculated. And there's a lot of evidence about the, um, the stress reducing power and benefits of birdsong, having birds uh, around us. So um, if you had to try to, to summarize all of this research, it, it is hard, it's very difficult. I, I did a presentation at a, a big healthcare conference a while ago where I tried to, tried to do this, essentially came up with this slide um, and it's really hard. And it is definitely the case that there are so many things um, you see on the right that are associated with nature, with the presence of nature, with exposure to the natural world. And it is the case that we see lower levels of depression and anxiety and lower levels of stress, improved mood, improved happiness, uh, some evidence that uh, that crime uh, goes down in neighborhoods that are greener, controlling for, for, for other uh, variables. Gun violence is, is lower in, in greener neighborhoods. Even uh, evidence coming out of experimental psychology that, that suggests that we are more generous in the presence of nature. We're more cooperative in the presence of nature. We're uh, able to think longer term. So you can make a strong case that we, when we have nature all around us, uh, we are actually better human beings. Nature helps us to be better human beings. So if you uh, were to try to summarize all of this, it's hard. We, we are often using the word flourishing, um, partly because that, it, it, uh, implies things like happiness and pleasure and, and, and cognitive abilities, but it's also about purpose and meaning in, in life. And, and nature is a really important uh, part of that. Um, so, you know, we, we actually have a, a project right now uh, where we're trying to understand what uh, our cities are doing uh, have been doing in real time to respond to the challenges of the pandemic and how, how we deliver uh, nature and contact with nature um, you know, during periods of, of lockdowns and, and uh, quarantine. And so these are images actually from a couple of our partner cities, Portland, Oregon on the left and Edmonton, uh, Canada on the, on the right. 
and if there is any uh, silver lining from this terrible period that we've been in, is it is I think that we have uh, a renewed sense of of how important nature is. It's been a saving grace. It's been that solve, that balm that keeps us going. It certainly has been the case for me. And, uh, and for a lot of people, um, a, a connection to nature, uh, partly because of the slowing down of everything and the ability to sort of pay attention maybe to things like birds that um, we, we might not have seen or heard in the same way, um, we're hoping that when the pandemic is over, there, there will be, that, that the sense of, of the importance of nature will continue. Um, so um, just as an example of, on the left is Forest Park in Portland. Uh, this is real, a great example actually of the sort of unprecedented desire to, content, to be in parks and to experience nature. And in, in the case of Forest, uh, Forest Park, they've uh, created a series of one-way loops as a way of maximizing the number of people who can enjoy um, this park. Um, what are we learning from COVID-19? And I, I think one of the things we're learning is to use the image on the right in Edmonton, that we are uh, beginning to appreciate all of those spaces around us. And it's parks to be sure, but it's all, all the other forms and, and places where we see where we have some ability to connect to, to nature. And it might be that uh, corner forested lot or one's backyard or, or one's balcony where you might be able to grow a little bit of food. Um, we are frequently arguing for more nature in cities because of the many services, of course, provided by nature. Um, we, we say that any, just, just about anything that you could do to make a, a community more biophilic or a city more biophilic will also make it more resilient. This is these are images from Rotterdam where they've had to think about and, and deal with water. Uh, and so it is uh, very much the use of nature. Um, for example, the use of water, the, the design of things called water plazas, which uh, are uh, new public spaces and neighborhoods, but they're also designed to absorb, retain uh, stormwater. Uh, and, and an emphasis on, on things like green rooftops in, in Rotterdam. Um, so there is definitely a, a, a movement going on in the world around this uh, discovery or rediscovery of nature. And it goes by many different names. Um, part of this is what I would call biophilic design, which has been mostly about building scale design. And um, this is for me kind of really the beginning point of thinking about biophilic cities. Um, lots of wonderful new design work uh, going on around the world, incorporating nature in, in, into the spaces and interior spaces of, of buildings, designing buildings with natural daylight, with natural ventilation, with living nature throughout. Um, these are images from a wonderful cancer center in Toronto, we've gotten to know Ty Farrow, uh, architect there, uh, fairly well. And you see the living nature, the, the living trees, but also these uh, engineered laminated wood, wood beams, uh, which are designed to give you this sort of feel as you walk into this cancer center of, of being in a forest. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful story, but we have many other stories. And, and by the way, before, if I forget to to say this, Ashley mentioned our webpage, it's biophiliccities.org. And uh, one of the things you'll find is a, a page um, that has a, a lot of our films. So one of the things we've been doing is to try to capture as many of these wonderful stories as we can in short documentary films. And at some point I'm gonna run out of time and just sort of flip through the slides. Uh, but if you um, are interested, we'd love for you to Go to the web page, look around, especially look at the films, and they're they're five to ten minute films about things like this building. And this is what made me think of it: is this is the new uh, Center for Sustainable Landscapes um, at the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh, which is a wonderful uh, biophilic design. It's a, a uh, certified living building under the Living Building Challenge. We can talk about that more later about what that is. 
Uh, but it's a wonderful story. So we have, a, um, I think, a six minute film about that, that building, uh, really quite Im impressive windows uh, that give you these expansive views um, of nature. Nobody's far from natural light. Um, what you see here in the sort of middle frame is the middle of the image is a wonderful public uh, green roof um, with mostly native plants. Uh, so it's a wonderful story in many, in many ways. Um, there are so many people working in biophilic design right now, and there's certainly a very active discussion about what it means, what are the design uh, qualities and elements and attributes. Uh, one of our heroes is a guy named Stephen Kellert, um, who's now passed away, but who taught for many years at Yale and, and uh, sort of uh, got me headed down this path to uh, framing cities in terms of biophilia. And he came up with, among other things, came up with uh, this set of design elements and attributes. And I don't have time to go through all of this, but, but just highlighting a few things that uh, to give you an idea of what we're talking about. And, and it's, it certainly is color and water and air and natural ventilation, plants, animals, but it's also shapes and forms uh, in nature. It's, it's botanical motifs, it's um, connections with animal life. It's those fractals I, I mentioned. Um, it's also connections to place and spirit of place and doing what we can uh, by celebrating nature uh, avoiding placelessness or the sameness that many of us feel in American communities today, and a sense of awe. I'll, I'll maybe circle back to, to, to some of these later, but uh, we believe that the, the communities we live in ought to be places that inspire this sense of wonder and sense of awe, those things that, again, make life worth living and that, that uh, you know, provide a sense of of purpose and meaning and, and uh, deep connection to uh, people and the places where we live. So we have, a, again, a number of uh, profiles, case studies of wonderful work. This is actually another uh, building that we just about two weeks ago uh, uploaded a new film that we've made. It's another five, five or seven minute film. This is the Frick Environmental Center in Pittsburgh, another living building, certified living building, wonderful biophilic qualities with a special emphasis on wood. Um, and wonderful story on the right of, you see the little, um, what looks like, look like little strings coming down over the glass. And uh, this was a really creative retrofit to make this part of the building bird friendly. Well, we can maybe talk about bird friendly uh, urban design, but these are um, actually uh, paracords, parachute cords, and they hang down from above. It's a it's a sort of a do-it-yourself uh, system. Uh, they work with some local high school students to, to make this facade bird, bird safe. So <clears throat> many other examples. <clears throat> Another one that you may have heard about is, is the Candida building uh, on the campus of Georgia Tech. Another wonderful biophilic building. And like all of the uh, certified living buildings, they have to be net zero uh, energy, net zero water, uh, so all these buildings produce more energy than they actually need. Uh, and, and so uh, we want to have that connection with nature, but we also want to pretty quickly address things like climate change. This building has also a, a, a strong emphasis on, on wood and wood as a sort of biophilic um, uh, building material. So wonderful stories of biophilic <clears throat> buildings. This, this, I think, may be my last one. Um, and, and yet another example of a building, we have a, a five minute film about this. The Interface Carpet uh, Company has uh, done a, a wonderful retrofit of a, of a 1950s building, uh, a really sustainable way of going about um, designing and build, designing a new headquarters for them. And it, its most uh, dramatic feature is this um, facade, uh, more than 300 panels of glass, as you see here in the quote, a semi-transparent recyclable polyester sheath um, on which is a life-size forest. So you, you will, if you ever drive by this building uh, in Atlanta, you will uh, be, be struck by it. It's, it's really uh, a wonderful uh, building. Um, I, I actually wasn't my last building. This is one that we've been uh, studying as well. It hasn't yet been built, but designers walk. We have a, 
a, a number of uh, uh, buildings and, and designers um, designing so-called vertical forests like this one. So several hundred uh, trees eventually in this residential uh, tower and these wonderful sort of uh, balconies and terraces that actually design uh, planting spaces for the trees in, into the floor plates of the structure. So it's uh, really a wonderful design. <clears throat> but we think that a biophilic city is, it's certainly a place, certainly a city with lots of biophilic buildings. And it's certainly a city that embraces biophilic design, but it's more than those buildings. Um, and so we like to think of a biophilic city as a city that, that is a, a city that emphasizes connections to the natural world. It's the buildings and, and parks, but it's all the other spaces in that city. Um, and we sometimes refer to this as um, sort of roo rooftop or room to region or bioregion and all, all of the scales uh, in, in between. So it's all of these uh, things. It is about connecting us to the natural world, but it's also about connecting us to each other, which is something the evidence is pretty compelling that nature helps to do that for us. Um, our vision of biophilic cities is also about, about conservation. Uh, we recognize that cities have to be part of the response, part of the answer to global loss of biodiversity. So partly this is about making space in and around where we live and in, in cities for other forms of life. And we frequently talk about this in terms of, of coexistence. And there's an ethical dimension then to this vision of biophilic cities that we, uh, we're, we're duty bound to, to make room for other forms of life. Um, and the quality of our lives is enhanced as a result of that. Um, this is a, quite an ambitious vision. And this is a building, a relatively new building called the Park Royal in Singapore. And Singapore is one of our original 10 partner cities. And it is a city that exemplifies this sort of uh, vision of immersive nature. Um, and so they are, for many, many years, they called themselves a garden city. Uh, more recently, they have called themselves a city in a garden. And that seems like a little change, but it's really quite profound. The idea that we don't just want cities where you have certain places where you can find nature, that you have to go to the park to experience nature. We want to live in the park. We want to live in the garden. Um, and, and that is the, the, the vision that our cities, cities in our network are, are really em embracing. And so um, Singapore has gone through its own recent um, shift in thinking, and they are now calling themselves a city in nature, partly a response to the sense that maybe the garden is a, an image or a vision that's a, of a little bit too, too much tended nature, right? We, we want some wildness uh, in the cities where we, where we live. And, and um, really interesting to see how that has um, strengthened during their lockdown during the pandemic. So uh, Singapore is a wonderful example of of a city, a city state that has adopted a whole bunch of different policies to implement this idea of, of immersive nature. Um, this building is an example of something called the landscape replacement policy. So whenever a building is, uh, is approved or, uh, and built, it must replace the nature lost at ground level with at least the same amount in vertical nature. And what's happening now is a friendly competition between uh, designers and building and developers to see, to see how they can maximize the amount of vertical uh, nature. So in this case, it's two to one. And so there's twice as much nature now in the vertical and it's sky gardens and green rooftops and, and uh, flowing you know, kind of nature over the sides of the, of the, the, the structure, um, a, a really verdant uh, example of, of of biophilic design, really. Um, we've often described this as a, a vision of, of a whole of nature, a whole of a city approach, rather. Again, room to rooftop or, um, you know, all of the different scales. Um, this is an image of, of Helsinki on the left, where you can move pretty effortlessly from a dense center city uh, all the way out to old growth forests at the edge of that of that city. And uh, 
that's the kind of vision um, we have in mind, uh, the kind of experience of living in a biophilic city. Uh, it is a vision and a movement that understands that we want to, we want to spend as much time, we want residents and, and people to spend as much time as possible outside, outdoors. Um, but it's also, we recognize the reality of, of indoor living and indoor working. So it's uh, indoor and outdoor and overcoming where we can the barriers between indoor and outdoor, indoor and outdoor realms. Um, and again, it's the room to the region. Um, here's an example of the ravine uh, system in Toronto, the lower, lower right. Toronto is uh, the newest member of our network. And it's uh, moving from seeing all of these green features and, and natureful design elements as being kind of discrete to understanding the city as, as a matrix, as a, uh, um, as a system, really, and um, understanding these things in terms of pathways and connections and, again, ecosystems. So uh, Pittsburgh has joined our network, and uh, this is an image just to sort of make the point that the, the vision of biophilic cities is seeing, maybe seeing cities in new ways and understanding that even in very heavily developed places, there will be a lot of nature. And we look out at that, that bridge and that uh, could well be a uh, habitat for peregrine falcon, it might be. Um, but it's also the water and it's the um, uh, things like the new parks that the city is designing to connect people to that water. Um, the forest canopy is another element of this and they're quite proud of their 42% uh, tree canopy uh, cover. And so um, Pittsburgh is uh, one of the, um, one of our cities, I wanna just say a couple of words. There's a, there's a, I'm fast running out of time. I have run out of time, but there is information on the webpage about how you join officially as a partner city. And there are joining requirements um, there's a narrative part of it that you have to um, describe how you are already biophilic and set forward some goals and aspirations for the future. You have to uh, select a certain number of indicators. Um, and then you, uh, one of the most important uh, requirements is that cities have to have a city council adopted proclamation or resolution saying uh, that they're joining the network and they're aspiring to become a biophilic city. And when that happens and a city joins, uh, often I show up. Uh, here's Mayor Peduto, the mayor of, of Pittsburgh, receiving the certificate. And, uh, and so we now have um, 24 cities in this network. Um, this is a fairly up-to-date map. And we can talk some more about this if you're interested. It's very North American. About half the cities are North America and the other half around the world. Uh, we are trying to expand the network in Latin America. We're trying to, we've got one city in Australia, one city in India, um, but we're ho hoping to expand in Africa and, and, and China and lots of other uh, parts of the world. So I should uh, probably at this point do the five seconds for each slide and just give you uh, a sense, at least visually, of what our cities are doing. These are some of them. Um, there are wonderful uh, initiatives. One of the things that you could conclude from this is that there is no one um, single way of thinking about what a biophilic city is and, and the opportunities to insert, to restore, include nature in cities will vary from place to place, from climate to climate. Uh, and and the, the political and economic and other circumstances will be different as well. So here is a wonderful sidewalk uh, uh, landscaping initiative in San Francisco, Vittoria Gastez, capital of Basque country, a uh, wonderful story of its green ring that circles the city. This is a new daylit uh, um, river that, that has brought back, been brought back to the surface, uh, was underground in a pipe. Uh, we have a, a wonderful film about the conversion of a sterile uh, center city water feature, highly chlorinated, sterile, uh, energy intensive 
and conversion, converting that to wonderful native biodiverse wetland. And this is Perth, uh, Western Australia. And they hopefully will be joining the network soon. Uh, but it's uh, connections to natural systems like uh, rivers and James River here in Richmond. Richmond is uh, now in the network as well. Uh, their emphasis, though, is on social equity and recognizing that not everyone in the city, uh, particularly neighborhoods of color, don't have the same access to the river and don't have the same levels of nature. And so this is something that we're finding in many of our cities. So they've, they have a new uh, draft uh, a, a plan, comprehensive plan that's setting some wonderful nature targets. And uh, this is uh, LeVar Stoney, the mayor of, of Richmond, and he's actually already established five new uh, parks to partly to address this, this issue. Okay, I'm um, gonna stop. Uh, I think I wanna go to the very end here. Um, I'm, it seems like I'm far away, but um, I did wanna if, if mention that there are some resources. There, there's the webpage, there are the films. Um, we also have a, um, uh, we also have an online journal called Biophilic Cities. And uh, here are some recent covers of that journal. Um, all the contents online, wonderful articles, go and take a look and actually articles on many of the, the projects and cities I've been mentioning tonight. Um, the, in the network, there are many things that the cities do, city to city exchanges, um, the films, I've already mentioned that. Uh, we have a new film about Gotham Whale, a nonprofit in New York City that's, that's uh, working on um, raising awareness about uh, whales uh, in that, in the city and the um, waters of New York. We have an online uh, uh, library of what we're calling biophilic patterns and a, a kind of global pattern book. And I can tell you more about that if you're interested. Um, there are some books, uh, including a book about biophilic cities that sort of started things back in 2010. And um, this is a full length film called The Nature Cities. Uh, the most recent book is an island press book called The Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design. And I think I will stop. And there is the web page. And uh, actually, just to back up for one second, I'll make a, a slight pitch uh, for birds. And this actually is the newest book that just came out last month called The Bird Friendly City. And, uh, and we have, I think, four or five short films on the web page um, about cities that are doing innovative things to protect and conserve birds and incorporate birds into uh, the design of neighborhoods and, and urban settings. So I will stop there and stop sharing. And sorry to have gone a little bit late, a little bit long. Um, but uh, let's, yeah, let's have some questions and, and or some comments or discussions or however you want to react. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I think it's very clear from your presentation that there's just so much opportunity within this broad umbrella of what biophilic city means. And, um, and I think that that's, that's been fantastic. And there's a lot of ideas to draw from of what people, what other cities have done. Um, but it's really about drawing into um, a place and creating a sense of place um, where where we are. So I will open it up to um, to our audience for their questions and, and comments. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just have, seeing the um, chat box now. So I'll, I'll take a look and- Yeah, I was going to start with the chat those. box. I, I'm sorry if I um, uh, mess up your name, but um, Mari, Mario Lee Fellows, if you want to come in and ask your question. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> this is this is Mary Lee. Um, Mary Lee. I, I think I was asking um, the question of uh, whether whether um, you know about the Biden administration, whether they're going to do anything specifically or generally to further these ideas of the biophilic city, and also whether you have any ideas about what they're going to do about sustainability. If yeah. Um, I, I don't have any great, I don't have any personal insight. Uh, I, I, obviously, they'll be uh, much more supportive of these ideas and envi environmental things, you know, more generally. Uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful, but I, I don't have any specific knowledge. Uh, many of the, the things that, you know, terrible things that we've watched happen, like 
you know, efforts to undermine the, the uh, Migratory Bird Act, for example, uh, we hope will be un, undone, you know, very, very quickly. But, uh, but so I, I don't know. And they haven't called me, <laughs> which they don't need to. But it's a good question. But. Julie, do you want to come in and ask your question? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm Julie Volkhaus. Um, great presentation, by the way. And I, it reminded me a lot of Uno's Garden, a book I read to my kids a lot. I'm sure you've heard of that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was wondering, as I work on planning in a lot of communities, um, we often are kind of criticized for promoting, you know, open space and you know, subdivisions, those sort of things. And then also it's hard to get um, preservation of parkland and greenways and things like that in a community because that, that land is so valuable. And the argument that I hear sometimes is, well, you are causing sprawl by integrating these things into the community and wasting that land where we could get more houses if we didn't have mm. to provide this open space. And, you know, what is your response to that? Yeah, yeah. How do we prevent sprawl but still have parks in our community? Right. Well, of course, I, um, as I started with, I, I am an advocate for, for more compactness and more compact urban form. Uh, that, that said, um, you know, we have opportunities to restore and enhance nature wherever in, in you know, urban, suburban, exurban, every, whatever the density level is, there, there will be an opportunity. But I, I mean, I, I would like to see a more compact urban footprint in part because that is, is how we need to conserve, um, you know, hinterland and, and habitat beyond the city. Um, and so a, a, a sprawling city, is a, it, it, that does represent a huge problem. And, and one of the things I didn't talk about, we, we have a new um, relationship with the Half Earth Project this another really important E.O. Wilson idea. And um, we do need to do everything we can to set aside as much uh, habitat as, as possible. Um, but the realities of where you work and the realities where many of us live is that, you know, it is, it is a, a sort of lower density a suburban environment. And so um, we do you know, want to make sure that those places are as natureful as possible. And so one of the things that I'm advocating in, in this book, um, the Bird Friendly City book is, and others have are as well, that we rethink the American lawn, for example. So the spaces, the, the you know, these sing, single uh, Kentucky bluegrass, single species, you know, sterile, ecologically, biologically sterile uh, environments around us could be wonderfully diverse, beautiful uh, native species. We, we know for birds, that's a huge benefit and a huge uh, need. And uh, Doug, Doug Tallamy, some of you know his, his work and I'm a big fan of his. And, and uh, the idea that we you know, begin to, if you just set half your, your suburban lawn aside for a native garden, uh, that would add up to, you know, a, a, you know, our largest national park, as he said, the idea of a kind of a homegrown national park. So, so wherever you're working, I think there, there will be opportunities, but it, you know, we have to balance that against um, urban growth boundaries and trying to do what we can for other reasons, for more efficient uh, infrastructure investments and all the other, you know, all the other reasons we, we want to, to reduce sprawl. Um, so it's a great question. And I think, I think we can, you know, we can have those, those concepts together in our heads and, and move forward, move them forward at the same time. It, you know, it's, um, I don't know what, what is your, your feeling about that? I mean, you're, if you're embedded in a, in a locality, it's maybe hard to think about a, a regional growth strategy or you know you're you're dealing with the people who are living there in your place i think that's community. great i think your response is excellent i know that's something that prince william conservation alliance is always pushing this conversion of your your lawn into native plants and everything yeah. that is a wonderful response to it and great. others may want to chime in as well but yeah tammy do you want to come in and ask your question 
Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Thank you so much. I'm from Reston in Fairfax oh. County. We and I love you, Dr. Beatley. Thank you. My question is to <laughs> you're all in our network. Yeah. Reston is you, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you probably know that the Reston yes, is of course. Reston. Okay, and okay. and I, that's why I'm calling. Um, I serve on the Reston Planning and Zoning Committee where we hear development coming into Reston. And right. we cannot get the county, let alone the developers, to buy into this. Fairfax County is build it and build it fast with the least amount of citizen input. We yeah. need to um, convert the county to demanding this from our to save our planet. It's that simple in my mind. Yeah. Do you have any advice? And God love Prince William for, uh, <laughs> you know, for helping us with this outreach um, and all of our counties. We are a region. We yeah. are not just a little dot. But right. do you have any um, suggestions for how we might uh, proselytize, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word, to the county yeah. to get them on board? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Well, it's a great it's a great question, and and it's um, going back to some of those arguments that I made in the beginning. Um, the the evidence is pretty pretty compelling, and so we are a species that needs to needs that that nature. Um, now I'm I tend to think of myself as a bio a biocentrist, so that it, it's not just what nature can do for me or do for us, not just those benefits, but rather it's a kind of an ethical obligation uh, to, to do what we can to protect and conserve. And th those birds that I, I talk about are have inherent worth and they, you know, deserve to exist irrespective of whatever, you know, pleasure I get out of watching them. So, uh, but I think that the arguments, the economic arguments, right, the, um, we have all of, there's a report, by the way, called the economics of biophilia that, that uh, my colleague Bill Browning uh, and others have authored they're working on a re re revision to that, but if you begin to, to see how um, the more nature we incorporate into schools, that, that leads to higher test scores and, and uh, better attendance and happier teachers. And I mentioned the crime rate going down in greener neighborhoods and life expectancy. Um, I didn't get really a chance to talk about the social equity issues, but uh, Richmond you know, has a dramatic difference in life expectancy depending on on you know what kind of neighborhood you live in and if you're in a in a, a treeless neighborhood that is really hot and 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 your life expectancy is going to be a lot lower that's a profound social equity uh concern and uh so i think i think that to all of these arguments make some headway um but on you know i'm not i'm not sure there's a, a, a magic bullet that is, is the best argument to make or the one that will carry the day with everyone. But it's, you know, what kind of a, of a place do you want to live in and, what, um, and, and what's really important? And um, the, the connections to nature, increasingly people are realizing, again, going back to that, if there, if there is anything positive that will come out of the pandemic, that, that that recognition of, of um, that nature is not something optional, but it's absolutely essential. So, so I don't know, I don't, have a, I don't have a wonderful answer for you, but part of it is politics and uh, part of it is getting folks together to, to lo lobby uh, elected officials and to elect officials who, who support this agenda. And we've seen it in our cities, Washington, for example, um, we uh, saw a, a grassroots group uh, called Biophilic DC. They were the ones, they lobbied every single city councilor in that city and got them to join the network. Um, and it's not a perfect story, but it's, you know, kind of the sort of the things we need to be uh, doing, I think. Um, but we do, you know, Arlington is, is now in the network and it's obviously, you know, different than Fairfax, but um, I, I think there's some lessons there. It's, it's uh, been really interesting to watch. I don't know if anyone is here from Arlington, but um, to see how the biophilic 
agenda has has really gained traction there and um, is is kind of make being embraced um, in a number of on a number of levels and and making its way, for example, into their um, public open spaces plan. And so I, I think I think it's possible to make some progress. Thank you so much. Yeah. You, you, I, you know, we had we watched it from afar as as you all kind of grappled with the uh, the golf course conversion uh, controversy. And I don't know if that if you know that Tammy, you will know a lot more about this than I do. But this was a uh, I guess a developer had purchased this this golf course and wanted to build houses. And um, there was sufficient opposition, right, from the community to stop that. We could debate the merits yeah. of that. And I, I don't want to take too much time because other people have good questions. But, but that same that a, developer is back yeah. trying to put 90 townhouses right adjacent to it in a very fragile ecosystem oh, area. No. With, okay. Yeah. And so this was why <laughs> I hadn't heard but, about that part. This is the genesis of my question. They waltz in yeah. and want, want 90 houses, um, and they've already taken it to the county for permit. And I'm like, dude, you don't even get it. You know, we're a biophilic mm -hmm. city. You have no interest in that. You just want the money. So yeah. it's it's tragic. But thank so you. So that's a, a different parcel then? Yes. Not, not part yes, of, okay. It's, it's just adjacent to it. Adjacent to the golf course. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you so much. Uh, a certain amount of political diligence that, that is required, right? And 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 that's one of the positive things about becoming part of the Biophilic Cities network. And um, once you're in the network, you know that in a way it is an it is an expression by that that community that they they endorse um, you know certain principles of um, protecting nature. And so when something happens in one of our cities, I get emails and calls from people saying, how can they be a biophilic city? They're doing this or they're doing that. And, and, um, and to me, it's a good sign that, that um, citizens and people kind of watching are holding them up, holding that community, holding the elected officials up to that, to that vision that they, that they endorsed. Um, and, and hopefully that will be, um, it'll be helpful in Reston as well over time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alex, do you want to jump in and ask your question? Sure. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Tim, do you know of any uh, communities that have incentive programs in place that address the equitable uh, access to biophilic areas for underserved residents? I think that's a big challenge because yeah. Well, yeah. Um, do you know of any communities that have programs, whether it be incentive or something written like policy wise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll think about incentive programs specifically, but um, it, it is the perhaps the, the the single most important issue I would say uh, in 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 our network right now, and it's the question that I get almost immediately after a presentation is, um, you know, what about the, the equity? What if we, we know that there is an unfair distribution of nature. Uh, we also know that when we do things like um, build parks like the High Line in New York, um, that there are unintended consequences and that there are uh, displacement effects and, and e eco-gentrification as it sometimes uh, referred to. So we, we at once you know, want to, we believe that nature, contact with the natural world, nature is a birthright. Everyone deserves it regardless uh, of income or race or anything else. Um, and, and that, you know, we want to, um, as in Richmond, we want more people living uh, near parks. We want um, more trees and in, in, in neighborhoods of color, but we also recognize that we need we need tools that will will moderate those unintended consequences. And um, and we have seen some some wonderful stories. Uh, this is, doesn't quite address the incentives issue, but uh, um, places like Portland, Oregon that have uh, adopted a, a sort of 
um, policy of giving, make, making sure that there are parks um, and sufficient access to nature in every neighborhood. Kali Park was a, we have a, a, another film, I keep, I keep uh, sort of promoting these films, but we have a five minute film about Kali Park in Portland, which is a, in a, a neighborhood of color a place where they didn't have a park. Um, it's, a, it's a former landfill that's now a wonderful park. And it wasn't just the parks department that, that uh, designed and, and built this park from on high, uh, it was the neighborhood. And they, they designed it, they um, kind of you know, took charge of it. Um, and it's a wonderful story. Another um, really good example is the 11th Street Bridge Park in Washington, a number of of really creative initiatives to uh, make sure that the neighborhood, particularly on the um, um, east side of the Anacostia River, uh, benefits fully from that park and, and, and efforts to, to minimize the unintended consequences, making sure that they don't lose affordable housing, um, but that, you know, that, that residents from the neighborhood enjoy the employment from that connected to that park. And there's a, a um, sustainable development plan actually that was prepared ahead of time. So those are the, the kinds of things that cities are gonna have to do um, as they move forward, move towards this vision of immersive nature, but it has to be just uh, nature and just biophilia as we sometimes say, it has to be inclusive and has to be fair and it has to acknowledge the, the um, systemic racism that um, that explains so much of what we see in American cities today. So incentives, um, what, do you, uh, what do you have in mind, Alex? What would be an example? Well, like for instance, um, you know, if you create- Like a density bonus or a-, or a Yeah, well, I mean, no. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's out there, but you know, like if it could be, some of these biophilic areas can be considered uh, a portion of open space to meet the open space requirements or-, or uh -huh. That nature, something to you okay. know, uh, encourage them to do uh, to create biophilic areas, especially in the areas that are where you have underserved re uh, residents that don't have the access to parks and, and things like that, that have to otherwise hop on a bus or take some so sort of transit uh, to get to that destination. Uh, and the benefit would, you know, yeah. uh, be right. uh, multiple because then, you know, they wouldn't have to hop in a vehicle to go somewhere or take uh, the bus to go there, you know, and it's all there yeah. within walking distance. Right, right. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. I may have to get back to you on, on, uh, on examples. Um, we, we have plenty of examples of uh, incentive, incentive programs for, for, um, enhancing nature or including nature in, in design. Uh, for example, density bonuses for green rooftops, uh, which is something um, Portland, our partner city Portland has pioneered. But I, I don't know that that necessarily has helped in terms of equity. Um, I'll, have to think, I'll have to think some about that though. Okay, That's a good question. thank you. Thank you, Alex. Anyone else with a question? You can unmute yourself and, and pop in. We've covered a lot of ground, kind of highlighting the importance of grassroots movements to um, social equity to, um, yeah, just thinking of being more biocentric, not just thinking of what, what nature does for us, but just the, the ethical you're, questions surrounding yeah, that. You're taking notes, Ashley, yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> I have a follow-up question to Alex. Sure. Oh. A lot of the areas that do not have a, their fair share of green open space are all built. And in many areas, they're, you know, they could use some redevelopment. So a density bonus wouldn't really help mm -hmm. um, green up in what is already an underserved community. Mm -hmm. Are there strategies for directing resources to that in that direction? That's to Alex, right? Uh, currently- um, Well, no, I was asking you, no. but I would like to hear what Alex oh, says too. No, I'm just, uh, you know, that's something that we can consider, uh, you know, have further dialogue, especially as we're updating the comprehensive plan. Uh, when we get to the environmental chapter and land use chapter, we can look at those types of things. And, um, you know, we're starting that process now 
So, you know, anyone that would like to join is welcome to join us and provide feedback on that. But these are the types of things that we need to think of so that we can do what, like the city of Richmond has done with their comprehensive plan, put uh, uh, action strategies and goals in place that address those types of uh, um, uh, opportunities. Yeah, it's certainly, um, Kim, there's certainly lots of examples of communities that are you know, that have policies and, and, and programs to address inequity and the distribution of nature. The thing I was tripping up on was sort of the, the incentive based aspect of, of Alex's question. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, uh, if you're committed to doing it, uh, LeVar Stoney in Richmond, you know, already they, he sent his staff looking, what, what are the parcels of land the city already owns? Um, in underserved neighborhoods that could be parks, for example. And moving pretty quickly, I think it's the fastest, you know, example I, I know of, of, of establishing five new parks, you know, in a, in a, in a city in a few months. Um, lots of our cities have uh, inventories of vacant land, um, almost every city. And so Milwaukee is an example of a city in our network, and they have a program called Homegrown, which is about taking um, multiple vacant lots, often owned by the city, aggregating them, uh, designing wonderful pocket parks in, in underserved neighborhoods, uh, basically. And the same, lots of examples of tree planting efforts um, in neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods of color with low canopy, um, and a lot of creative work uh, there, lots of stories of, of places doing, doing that. Um, Austin, Texas, another example, uh, they have a social equity uh, sort of map uh, that's guiding a lot of investments in green schools and, and tree planting and, and a lot of really interesting stuff with carbon credits. Uh, city, city wants to be carbon neutral, so it's buying carbon credits, which fund all of this sort of wonderful tree, tree planting going on in, in places where it's needed. Um, one, one Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, that that so a lot of a lot of examples like like that, um, and and really inspiring things going on, um, and and you know, and in, in the in the era of George George Floyd and George Floyd's murder, and uh, are grappling with longstanding you know uh, racism. Uh, I have to say, a lot of cities are are rising to the to the occasion, rising to the challenge. Go ahead, Julie. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't mind, Kim, I'll, I'll just throw in a, a suggestion in terms of incentives for creating more, uh, um, you know, greenery within our urban environment. What I'm seeing, at least in the town of Leesburg, where I live, is redevelopment of our shopping centers. And I think oh, that is yeah. a great opportunity for breaking up some of that impervious surface and incorporating yeah. some parkland. The right. developer gets some density, they get some residential, which is usually what they want. And then they still include some commercial, but now they have to provide some open space. So they're moving up, you know, basically, yeah. but they still have to provide some greenery in there, which I think does make for a um, yeah. greener town, a more biodiverse. Yeah. So you have some examples of that now? Or... Yes, well, actually, um, we have one that is in the works, and I'm really, <laughs> I'm really pushing the developer to be a little bit more biophilic. <laughs> so okay. maybe, maybe I'll introduce him to some of your books, um, but yeah, in the rural crescent of Leesburg, we've got um, a shopping center that's being looked at called Virginia Village. Okay, um, and, Virginia and, Village. Yeah, um, and it's a form-based code project where we're really okay. trying to get some of that nice design in there, some treescaping, and right now it's all cotton, mm. it's all pavement. Okay, well, let us know if we can help you. Um, one of the things we did, um, and I don't know if Tammy, if you were there, but we right before the pandemic started, I think it was something like mid-February, we, we did a, a forum uh, in, um, in Reston. We've done several of them where, where we've basically um, shown slides of what, what's possible. What are, what, what's high, higher density biophilic design look like and, and what are the, what, what's going on in other American cities. And that seems to really help if you can show uh, it's not just a an architectural rendering of some somebody's idea. It's these are actually projects that are very that are economically profitable, and they you know uh, shopping center redevelopments, whatever it is. We have a whole kind of you know extensive slideshow, and anytime we can help you, 
uh, in terms of examples or, um, you know, help, helping to sort of show what's possible, let us, let us know. Oh, I'll definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. We, we did. Yes, one I another. will also, I was, and I was thinking here of um, our big shopping mega stores or Potomac Mills. Yeah. A number of years ago, the Simon companies purchased them all. Right. And um, they wanted to be a little bit more upscale and they went through a massive effort to be energy efficient. Hmm. And um, at the time I was on the planning commission, so I was involved in the discussions Ooh. and they were just so proud of themselves. And I asked what they would be doing outside. Uh -huh. And everybody stared at me and said, well, we hadn't thought of that. Yeah, okay, wow. So I think that the education component yeah. and the communication component is hugely important. It is, absolutely. Um, because that's your foundation for yeah. forward. Yeah. And and Definitely. to hop on Kim's comment, um, the Fairfax County is uh, so huge as is Prince William, and we don't have cities, we don't have political cities. Mm -hmm. So we have to convince the Board of Supervisors, right. and like Kim and Potomac Mills, we have uh, Fair Oaks Mall completely mm. being redone, but okay. not any conversation to amount to a hill of beans about bringing nature in. Oh, they're gonna have a few trees and this, that, but nothing about <clears throat> making all those parking spaces into parks. And, right. you know, there's this yammering about, oh, we have to serve the underserved, but nothing actually to do. And there are wonderful people in Fairfax that want it, but it's getting the massive government that is on a, a roaring train to develop mm. every square inch to, into urban and not paying attention to the planet. And that is, this, in essence, our Waterloo. Okay. Well, I was just caught by something you said, Tammy, that they think only in terms of the urban, where I think what Tim is saying is that trees and green open space is part of the urban. I, I agree with, I 100%, but try to get the, the leaders of Fairfax right. to understand that when all they're looking at, I guess all they're looking at, and it's not every supervisor. We have a monopoly of people, but the leaders mm -hmm. are hell bent on development and, they, and they're doing it during the pandemic when we can't really mm. mount any sort of, of opposition. We're so handicapped because it's all virtual meetings and you're time right. limited, et cetera. So, right. you know, we have executives of the county running around talking about placemaking, mm. but it has, it has less to do with greenery and nature than it has to do with how to make these places economically pay off for the county taxpayer. And to your point, yeah. I get it. The nature, they're, you're sort of, they're sort of fighting themselves, but they don't understand they're fighting themselves. So how mm -hmm. to get that message that if you bring nature in, you're actually reducing your cost of right. schools, crime, health. You know, they just, if they can't make that equation. They're, in other words, they're uneducated. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other final comments? Well, I, I might just, uh, before, Ashley, before you dismiss everybody, uh, <laughs> if you're about to, I don't know, but uh, I just will again make a pitch for uh, joining us in this movement. And you could do that in part by going to the webpage. I didn't really say it this way, but you could, you can actually join the network as an individual. I've most, mostly I was talking about partner cities and, and how cities can join, but you can join as an individual, you just go online, uh, sign a pledge, and then you're in the network and organizations can do that as well. And we have several thousand individuals, I think at this point, and then you get all the emails and uh, other things from us. Um, and so just make that final pitch. Yeah, and I will provide the, um, the web page when I send out the link to the the presentation once we upload it to YouTube. 
So um, Tim Beatley, thank you so much for joining us today. I think one of the big takeaways from all of this is just the idea. I, I have this vision of like these concentric circles, like starting out with like an individual to a building, to a neighborhood, to a city, yeah. and how we let um, nature in at all of those levels. Um, and I think that there's a lot of really great examples out there that we can take and continue um, maybe finding ways to implement in our respective areas. Um, so thank you so much for your time and um, sharing your expertise with you. And uh, we really look forward to continuing the conversation. Great. Hopefully your program will get us jump started here and we can have a new conversation coming out of all directions. Absolutely. Wonderful. I'll, I'll look forward to hearing about the progress. Always over. wishful. <laughs> <laughs> and anything I can do to help, let me let me know. Will do. Yeah, you are uh, clearly um, a wonderful resource. So thank you so much. Thanks. Fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, that was wonderful. Well, thanks. I, um, um, do, do let me know if, it, if folks have questions or... Um, yeah. I guess I did have a slide that had my email on the at the end. So. I can provide that too if yeah, um, when good. I send out because I always send out a follow up email, um, and so I can provide the link yeah. and your your email so people can stay okay. in touch. Okay, very good. Well, thanks. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks and so much. Or to staying in touch. Okay. Absolutely. Bye. Okay, I'm going to end now. All right, thanks, Kim. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Program. It was wonderful. <laughs>